Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is David Sproles, and I'm the president of the New York School of Interior Design, and I am thrilled to welcome you all tonight to our inaugural Michael and Patricia Sovereign Lecture on Design. Pat and Mike. Yes. This special program is made possible by a generous gift from Michael and Patricia Sovereign for the enrichment of the college's public programs. So thank you, Pat and Mike, who are sitting here in the front, uh, for making this all possible and for your generosity. This annual lecture is a wonderful and important gift to the college and those we serve. Students, aspiring designers, established professionals, and friends who are interested in design and understand its importance in our everyday lives. So thank you for making it possible. And thank you, Pat, for your continued leadership as chairman of the Board of Trustees. Um, your dedication to the institution is palpable, so thank you. And I always forget to mention when I introduce lectures, there's a reception afterwards. So please join us in our 69th Street Gallery for a glass of wine and some, and some nibblies. So anyway, tonight's lecture is presented by none other than Barry Bergdahl. Barry is an esteemed scholar, author, curator, and a true leader in architectural history, theory, and criticism. He is the Meyer Shapiro Professor of Art History at Columbia University. He also served as the Philip Johnson Chief Curator of Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art from 2007 to 2013, where he continues to be a Curator of Architecture. Barry holds a BA from Columbia, an MA from King's College, Cambridge, and a PhD also from Columbia. His broad interests center on modern architectural history and well, with a particular emphasis on France and Germany since 1800. He is author or editor of numerous publications, including Bauhaus 1919 to 1933, Workshops for Modernity, Mies in Berlin, European Architecture 1750 to 1890, and the list can go on and on and on. There is many more. As curator, Barry has participated in several major architectural exhibitions and has earned a reputation as a champion for young, boundary-pushing talent around the globe. He has curated a number of groundbreaking exhibitions at MoMA, including Home Delivery, Fabricating the Modern Dwelling, where many of you will recall he filled the empty lot next to the museum with high design prefabricated housing units. Uh, Rising Currents, projects for New York's waterfront, which took place in 2010, I should mention three years before Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and in 2012, he organized Foreclosed, Rehousing the American Dream, another timely and relevant topic. So, with all of that being said, I'm going to pass the podium over to Barry Bergdahl. It's a great pleasure to give this inaugural lecture, I must say, as well, uh, for friendship and connections with Pat and, and, and Mike, not the least that I think I was in some way or another at Columbia for almost all of the years of your presidency. So it's delightful to be here. I've put myself a very tall task for this evening. So at times, even given my hoarse voice, I might go uh, a little bit rapidly through some of the images because I want to try to interweave three components. One, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, a paradox that fascinates me, which we might call the impossibility but the durability of the uh, architectural exhibition. The second uh, is to give you a little bit of the framework of the emergence of the Museum of Modern Art as one of the most uh, productive and powerful platforms for taking on that impossible paradoxical activity. And thirdly, uh, as I've returned to teaching, I find that I have myself become a bit of a historical subject, so I'm going to look back, I hope, with a little <laughs> reflection uh, on what in the world I thought I was doing, uh, particularly when I identified what I like to call in this image uh, a form of curating that I call the extreme sports curatorship version, uh, which involves committing to exhibit work that does not yet exist uh, by architects whose work you scarcely know. That is what we did in uh, 2010, uh, when I asked groups of people to imagine how New York might make itself more resilient uh, for the joint phenomena of sea level rise and, <coughs> and climate change and more frequent storms. This is going to reassure you that when you see this image appear again, we are near the end of the lecture. <laughs> 
I'm at work on another project, and you can see these two titles are interrelated. At Home in the Museum, we might say, is related to the question initially that I was posing myself as an academic who went into curating if I was at home at the museum, but the larger question of whether architecture can be at home in the museum. Uh, it being nearly impossible, of course, uh, to exhibit uh, architecture in its fullness uh, as building, as spatial experience, as something experienced over time uh, and in situ and in place. Uh, this has now framed the topic of a lecture series and I'm working on it as a, on a book that I want to summarize for you in the beginning under the title Out of Sight in Plain View, a uh, history of exhibiting uh, architecture. This is actually a photograph that I hope you all recognize is the Museum of Modern Art. This is where I've just come from. Uh, my office occupies the site of one of the most popular exhibitions ever staged there, paradoxically enough, the reproduction of a 17th century Japanese temple uh, ha as the third in a series of houses uh, in the garden. But it also stands in rather nicely for the problem that here, this house is not yet in the museum. The best way to stage the most popular exhibition was to stage it outside in the garden and put a frame uh, around a real building uh, and therefore take it in a certain sense slightly out of the context of the city uh, and call attention to it. Uh, indeed, what does it mean to exhibit architecture? You could ask, is an architecture once it is built always already on display? Even without going perhaps to the extremes here on the right of putting a display case around a building, as in here the, the case of the a glass box put a number of years ago to protect the house of Domenico Sarmiento, the great uh, Argentine hero and seventh president of that country in the middle of the 19th century. This wonderful house in, in the El Tigre district uh, is visited as an object in a display case by uh, thousands every summer. So here is a very beautiful example of, I guess you could bring the museum to the house by putting the apparatus of a display case around it, both for protection and calling attention to it as somehow better and different than the houses around it. At the very beginning of my story on the left-hand screen, an imaginary view of the possible transformation of the Louvre Museum, the Louvre Palace, into a museum by the painter Hubert Robert. Uh, this in the final days of the Ancien Regime, as discussions were getting underway if the disused palace uh, might in fact house a rather novel institution, a public museum. Uh, you can see that Hubert Robert had every artist's dream, which is that the museum would ex it be exclusively devoted to showing his work. Uh, <laughs> all of the artifacts uh, of Rome that he had painted uh, over the years. I'm using it not in the way that he intended, uh, which is to say that until perhaps a case as rare as this one, we have always struggled uh, with the notion that to display architecture means essentially to manipulate representations, whether they be part of the design process or whether they be representations made uh, after the fact. But the actual bringing of architecture uh, into the gallery is uh, something of a paradoxical difficulty. And yet when I began to undertake this research to find out when this activity began uh, and to trace its, uh, its history and its ups and downs, I discovered, as I'm going to argue in a few minutes, that the practice went back to the heart of the 18th century, to the Enlightenment, and to the core of the moment when architects thought a debate on architecture might have a bigger public if it could be moved into the space of the gallery. And I hope to come full circle by showing you how what I've tried to do is to return to the origins in using the Museum of Modern Art frequently to try to incite debates on very, very timely and urgent problems and to show uh, a larger audience the stakes of architecture and of design, for it seems to me that there are two professions that are too easily marginalized and the role of the museum in the end uh, is to show how essential they are to some of the most vital uh, concerns that are facing us. And as I did this research, I discovered that over the course of the 18th and 19th century, this difficulty never stopped people from inventing. In a certain sense, the architectural exhibition uh, or the architectural museum as it began to emerge after, 1900, after 1800, excuse me, particularly in these two spectacular uh, examples, the now disappeared uh, monument, uh, Museum of French Monuments, the Musée des Monuments Francais of Alexandre Lenoir, in which the objects that had been taken from the nobility and the church under the French Revolution were redeployed in historical sequence in these brilliantly colored rooms of a disused convent, or John Soane's magical and poetical uh, museum in which he tried to bring back the fragments but also the drawings that he had uh, collected to create an architecture museum. So as hard as this is, 
And as much as it gives a new diversity of interpretation to each attempt to exhibit architecture, what really struck me when I was undertaking this research was that from about 1750 when it begins until today, the number of architectural and design exhibitions have simply ballooned year after year, decade after decade. So how I asked myself, was it possible that something that was so difficult, the impossibility of bringing the building into a gallery space, had nonetheless persisted? I asked, what if I could turn this question around that's been posed by so many historians of the architectural exhibition and say, what possibilities are created for the practice of architecture and design through the activity of, um, of exhibiting? What positive motivations and positive effects can we trace in the history? And then, being both a historian and a curator, uh, in what ways might we take them as uh, vehicles and as <coughs> instruments uh, for innovation uh, and for continued practice of bringing architecture into the museum? And the last question I wanted to ask myself, and I'd like to pose just for you as we uh, get started on my historical journey, uh, this is the Museum of Modern Art on an extremely quiet day shortly after I arrived in 2007. It's a rare moment when you can actually see the floor as well as the walls. Uh, and one could ask th yourself, uh, given up in the upper left, that's a um, kind of hashtag. If you get bored during this, you can curate at any given moment your own exhibition on your smart device by going to Archetizer, which is a site that will allow you to move images around and create your own exhibition on the space of the screen. So given these smart devices, uh, why is it that people are still crowded to museums? How do we explain the phenomenal popularity of museums? I have thoughts about that. We can discuss it in the uh, reception. But for the moment, I'd like to say that I realized that the moment I got to the Museum of Modern Art, this was a phenomenon not to be squandered how to take advantage of this captive audience, and in a sense, to return to what I want to trace for you for a moment, the emergence in the 18th century of the realization that the space of the gallery provides a place uh, for discourse, for discussion, and for engaging a larger public uh, in issues of architecture. From the beginning to the end, it's involved with the production of images, and in a certain sense, if this were a lecture on the history of architectural drawing uh, that ignored the space of the exhibition, it would also ignore why the techniques of architectural drawing have changed dramatically over the last three centuries, say from this late uh, 17th century drawing uh, by Filippo Juvara, submitted in the annual competitions of the Roman Academy, the Academia di San Luca in Rome, or this image, uh, which again, uh, this isn't the end of the lecture. We're going to return to it one more time. Uh, <laughs> when we find it at home in the museum. This image, uh, which captured people's attention in the Rising Currents exhibition and then began to circulate all around uh, the press uh, as an issue that catalyzed New York's thinking uh, on the problem of sea level rise and our low-lying coastline. So let's go back to the beginning. My first false start was to want to look at the history of competitions in the academies. Those academies that justified architecture later on design uh, as a st uh, having the status of a fine art along with painting and sculpture uh, through the activity of drawing and through projecting uh, a ideal building that could be uh, judged and assessed uh, for prizes. This became a system of architectural education uh, throughout Europe uh, by the end of the 18th century, transported into this country in the 19th century. But I decided in the end that these competitions were not really my starting point. For here, if we look at these wonderful anecdotal drawings of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, we see that the students having finished uh, their drawings, they had to finish them in an intensive uh, period of three months, took them in little chariots, hence the term to be en charrette, to be in a hurry, to get your thing in a chariot, uh, for depositing with the judge and then these top-hatted gentlemen came in to judge the competition. Here we see it already uh, in the 19th century at the top and into the 20th century, this system. The key thing to notice here is there are no members of the public present. So I decided that since for me, the architectural exhibition invites the public in, begins with the conversation between the act of making, the act of projecting, uh, and a conversation with a larger public, that I wanted to find a different starting point. Another false start came with this one, but it is a very interesting false start. This was the uh, decision by the 
church fathers of the Jesu in Rome in 1709 when they were commissioning designs for the chapel of St. Ignatius in the left transept that they would need to put uh, their designs on display. They had recourse to a public display of the designs, a display that left no visual record of the display technique, unfortunately, but is documented here on the right in a careful recording of all of the comments overheard in the display. This is what all curators dream of, somebody who would write what was uh, being said uh, while people are looking at the works of architecture or uh, any work in a museum. It is unbelievable, the records of the Academy tell us, this is a quote, how many ran from every part of the city to see it, stimulated by curiosity, which had been aroused by the shrill tones of, of earlier that had already spread word around Rome. Innumerable cardinals, bishops, prelates, princes, gentlemen, architects, painters, priests, monks, and laymen of every sort came. This was, in sum, a continuous flow of people, almost a fleet at sea. But in fact, as a historian of, the, of Jesuit architecture has recently demonstrated, the Jesuits' concern was not to open this up for public display. It was to manage gossip, to control what was being said. So in the end, it was a, it was a use of display as propaganda, right? The whole, the, one of the chief concerns of the church in the late Counter-Reformation. Uh, not to uh, foster discordant opinions, but rather to squelch them. Now it is this interest in soliciting rather than controlling public argument and public opinion, I would argue, following the course of the classic analysis of the interaction between press and coffee house by Jürgen Habermas in his influential, the structural change of the public sphere that marks for us the gradual entry of architecture into the public exhibition in London and Paris in the mid 18th century, just as both cities began significant periods of urban change. So here, if we look, for instance, in 1760 at the Free Market of London, the Society of Artists was the first of a series of venues where within a few years, architects would freely exhibit their works without being enrolled pupils or admitted members of any academy. At first, these were largely prints, such as the one that you see uh, on the left, and they would be uh, for sale as individual images or in bound books. So we might say that the exhibition was a little bit of a sales uh, mechanism. But soon, other types of projects began to find their way onto display, and thus into the columns of the new public handbills and magazines, and the exhibition quickly changed from being an advertisement that, for a multiple that could be purchased to making claims for architecture as an art form and for its stake in public debate. A lot of research remains to be done in the developments in, in Britain where a free market reigned, but one of the wonderful advantages we have are the collection of catalogs at the uh, Avery Library that allow a great deal of documentation of this. Originally, architects slipped in because they were view painters of exotic scenes and watercolorists, but soon architecture began to find its own place. Architectural drawing itself began to look more and more pictorial. It began to emulate those forms of landscape painting and of artworks that it wanted to compete with on the walls of these mixed media uh, ex exhibitions. And other architects began to realize that they could use the exhibition actually as a way of not only showing off their work, giving kind of annual reports on complex building sites, uh, but explaining their work uh, to the public and getting the public uh, engaged not only perhaps in commissioning them, but also with the ideas at stake in the work. Here too uh, arises another phenomena, which is the phenomena of the professional renderer, someone trained as a uh, designer of architecture, but who essentially spends his or her entire career, in this case Joseph Gandhi, uh, whose career is largely associated with rendering the projects of Sir John Soane. Here, the Bank of England. Now, if we think of the Bank of England, it was a work site that you could visit only with a VIP pass uh, that came directly uh, from the crown or the governors uh, of the bank. Yet it was one of the largest work sites uh, anywhere in Europe, and it was certainly the chief locus of Soane's uh, building activity for many, many years. His experimental laboratory, as we know, for, from all sorts of things to new types of spatial vaults to new structural techniques. Uh, and as he began to think how he could best evolve his uh, presentations in the Royal Academy, which began from the 1760s to allow architects to be included in the annual exhibition, he not only pushed Gandhi to provide ever more spectacular images, but sought to figure out how to deal with the rule that an, an artist could send in only one work. 
So if we look at the evolution of drawling, we begin to see things like this extraordinary drawling. Is the bank in a ruin or is it under construction? But here is a case, a kind of forerunner of the axonometric, where we can read a great deal of detail about the bank, much of it off limits to us if we're pedestrians or visitors, through this extraordinary bird's eye view. Uh, of the bank probably under construction. Would not be great technique for investors to imagine that this was a ruin, uh, as most historians have suggested. Uh, or by the early 19th century, when he was designing one of the first public-built galleries anywhere in Europe, the extraordinary Dulwich Picture Gallery to the south uh, of London, he came up with this omnibus presentation technique. It's actually one sheet of paper, and it qualifies, therefore, uh, to enter the um, exhibition. Now let's go back across the uh, channel uh, to, to France. The French Academy created a very different situation. In the same years in Paris, the artist who pioneered the exhibition as a form of uh, self-promotion, and this is Charles de Bailly, who is the architect and draftsman on the right, designing an uh, image of how he thought the Louvre could be retooled, rebuilt, restructured for a better presentation at the annual uh, Salon by opening up a a sort of skylight, but also a, a skylight that continued to the lower floor and creating more surface space, but also more space for people to see one another uh, at the exhibition. Charles de Bailly opened with his first act. Uh, interestingly, it was this, a painting uh, that of the Chateau de Montmoussa, an extraordinary project that at this point was only uh, projected uh, near uh, Dijon. De Bailly, uh, had the advantage of being a member of both the architecture and painting academies, and since architects were not yet admitted to display, he entered as a painter, showing an architectural project. He is probably the first person ever to show a projected project, to exhibit a project that did not yet exist uh, in a space for um, public debate. Only members, as I said, of the Royal Academy of Painting were allowed, had the right to exhibit. Uh, Charles Louis Clérisseau, the first architect ever admitted in 1769 to the Painting Academy, took advantages sometimes with views of antiquity or caprices, and from the first they were noticed and discussed in the press, notably in the Mercure de France. And once Clérisseau moved to London in the 1770s, he exhibited regularly there at the Society of the Arts and the Royal Academy to mixed reactions. And I'm just going to give you a few quotes because it's interesting here the emergence of a critical voice, of architectural criticism emerging also for the first time uh, here rather than in reviewing real buildings. The London Chronicle found Clarissot's drawings remarkable for taste, correctness, and variety of tints, a circumstance sel seldom met with in compositions by architects, they say. While Ho Horace Walpole noted in the margin of his 1772 catalog of the Royal Academy show, too much like a scene in an opera. So for him, it fear, it, he feared that architecture would become a form of scenography. But as I said, Desvalli was the first to exhibit his own work. Uh, and he, I think that this became for him a valuable instrument in the emerging public discourse on contemporary issues of architecture and urbanism. And he began increasingly to include historical figures, actors who were almost acting out the future life of the building uh, in those forms. This was a moment uh, when Paris was debating the abandonment of the capital by the king, but also Voltaire was calling for the demolition of buildings that uh, eliminated the possibility of a frame of space around a building such that it could be appreciated as a work of art. This is what was, is being proposed here uh, in this painting, proposing a demolition of those things that obscure from view the great colonnade of the Louvre. Uh, and likewise, with the competition and then exhibition of all of the proposals for a proper frame for the statue of Louis XV that the city of Paris proposed uh, to uh, erect in honor of Louis XV. Ultimately, the statue was erected on what is today the Place de la Concorde. This is one of my favorite maps of Paris. It imagines that 28 of the proposals were accepted and they were all put in this place uh, in Paris. Paris becomes uh, a display of sculpture, if you like. But this is the key drawing. This is uh, de Bailly imagining his future Comédie Française, the great theater to be built uh, on its own square on the left bank for the, for the Comédie Française uh, as a great mise en scène, not only of architecture, not only of actors, but of also public actors, attendees at the theater, 
who are draped in, uh, in part in Roman dress uh, in these uh, drawings that, as you can see particularly here, the one of the uh, vestibule that were exhibited in two successive salons and began to rival with history painting and have his architecture described in the same way that critics were discussing the architecture of the ancients viewed by famous painters. The other great display that came out of this, one of the most extraordinary of the period, was by the painter Lafont de Saint-Étienne, who was commissioned by the architect Soufflo to erect a one-to-one -one painting of the future portico of the Church of saint Genevieve. This is today's pantheon. You're not looking at a picture of a building. You're looking at a picture of an enormous canvas, a one-to-one -one painting of this great temple portico that was to be erected set up so that the king could come and lay the cornerstone and all of the public of Paris could gather around to witness this event, particularly up in these, uh, oops, excuse me, that's this area here uh, where the workers were given the day off. You see those are the more drunken participants in the, uh, in the back. They were given a day's wages and a, um, uh, and a ticket to the event. So successful was this that a year later, um, Las Fontes de Saint-Étienne uh, wrote about it so favorably that the painter decided to repaint it in the painting that you see here, which is today in the Musée Carnat Ballet, uh, and it was exhibited at the Salon to further commentary. We might think ahead, and I just threw this in a little bit uh, achronically, uh, to the current debate over the rebuilding of the center of Berlin, where Ber uh, Schinkel's Bau Academy, that many very conservative forces would like to see rebuilt in the center of Berlin, has been erected as a large photorealist one-to-one -one scaffold uh, to convince people that this building must be rebuilt uh, as it was uh, before it was demolished, dynamited by the East Germans in 1951. I photographed it here moments before the demolition of this real building, the old Palace of the Republic put under the, this artist's installation of Zweifel, which means a doubt as a photo meant to exhibit my doubts about this controversy, but I think it's interesting, and I bring it in here, because every one of the techniques I'm describing in the 18th century continues as a technique today. So this is not simply an archaeology of uh, old practices, but rather a genealogy of the possibilities of architecture on display and ultimately of bringing them into the gallery. The most consequential event for us is going to be the transition from this uh, piece sent into the Salon in early 1789 by de Bailly, in which he proposed a comprehensive master plan for replanning Paris as a modern city with all of his proposals uh, in pink. We could spend the rest of the uh, time on this, but uh, it's the fact of it more that interests me. Uh, de Bailly, therefore, exhibiting it in this situation, there it is again, uh, and bringing us to the next key date before I do us a jump start way into the 20th century. And this date for us is 1793-94. Two events take place during the French Revolution, which are perhaps uh, not recorded uh, so prominently in light of all of the other dramatic political events, executions, guillotines, and the like uh, that grabbed attention. But they are absolutely key for the history of exhibitions and the history of museums and the history of the paradoxical attempt to bring uh, architecture and its related arts uh, into the space of the museum, both the physical space uh, and the cultural space. This is a pair that represents the same individual in, I suppose, his active and more contemplative mode, uh, one of any museum historian's heroes, uh, uh, the a Alexandre Lenoir. Uh, on the left, he is trying to convince the sans-culottes at the Abbey of Saint-Denis that the royal tombs are not symbols of oppression, but rather works of national art that need to be protected both as memory and for their uh, ascetic glories. Uh, there he gives rise to a new word, which as Anthony Vidler points out uh, in a text of some years ago, was one of the many cultural neologisms of the French Revolution, the term vandalisme or vandalism, to commit violence against works of art as a form of political expression. We've certainly seen a great deal of that in recent times. So even the violence, as well as the techniques that I'm it, um, finding for you in the 18th century, have a long afterlife. On the right, having got some precious elements from this fight to save uh, the movement of property with the abolition of the monasteries, with the flight of the aristocrats, 
we see Gregoire in a new role, the first person ever to describe himself as a conservateur, the French word for curator. So here in 1794, the word curator is invented as someone who takes care of precious objects and then places them into new contexts, into historical sequences, into arguments, into ways that can either create the history of art, as Alexandre Lenoir was determined to do in his Museum of French Monuments, uh, or, which as we're going to see in the next part of the lecture, uh, could begin to produce powerful arguments that would affect public debate. One of the greatest exhibitions of the 18th century uh, has been studied in recent years because the uh, entry catalog uh, of the submissions has come to light. This was the competitions of the year two, the other great event of 1793 to 94. The first was the creation of the Musée des Monuments Francais with Lenoir. The second was the opening up of a series of competitions in all of the arts, painting, sculpture, metal making, ballad writing, but also architecture for ideal projects to promote the new society of the revolution, all to be put on display as a portrait of a world uh, on the brink of becoming. More than 150 architects took, place, uh, took part in this competition. It was probably the first exhibition ever in which architecture outnumbered all of the other arts on display. It's one reason why I like to dwell on it for a moment. Uh, it's also one of the first to have a, ca a detailed catalog with description uh, of all of the projects uh, that were there. And it was also one of the first to imagine that this catalog of projected new buildings was almost a constitution for a society, a kind of interpretation not only of the aesthetic bases, but even of the forms of legal debate that were happening at, at the moment on the organization of society and how that might be embodied in uh, architecture. Here, a project by Duvalier for transforming the Louvre definitively into a museum, a natural history museum on the ground floor entered through a cave and an art museum on the upper floor. Here's the actual project for restructuring the center of Paris and they went on and on. A, pub a place for a public assembly to restructure the center of Lille around a place for public singing and assembly in this extraordinary building. Uh, or here, a new temple uh, in which, a temple of liberty, in which the passage of new laws and the new constitution could be celebrated in place of a, uh, a church uh, devoted to the supreme uh, being. So here was a temple to civic virtues, perhaps the first of that notion that architecture would be part of first defining but then solidifying uh, democratic uh, experience, this by the architect Doron. Uh, some of these were even carried as models uh, into the revolutionary festivals, and we could go on and on, and it is in this context as well that the government decided that it would be necessary to obtain, acquire, and catalog the famous drawings of Etienne Louis Boulet that they might become what he had announced as the possibility of creating a paper museum of architecture which would regenerate society but also regenerate the education of architects uh, and designers. So it's like going back and forth between a public uh, and the training of a new generation as a possibility uh, for uh, the museum of architecture. Here, a imagination of what the Senate might look like uh, here again, that temple of equality. Uh, here, a shrine to the uh, victims of the revolution, the, those lost for the uh, fatherland. Uh, and here, a design for a provincial um, outpost of the legislative assembly in which the newly adopted constitution literally becomes the facade of the building. Uh, indeed, almost all of the themes of early 19th century architecture in France are already contained uh, in these over 100 building designs put on display in 1794. Just one little last footnote uh, on the late 18th century before we turn uh, to uh, more recent times. The competitions of 1794 did not go unnoticed outside the borders of France. Indeed, what was going on in France left, in France left nearly every monarchy uh, across the continent uh, nervous. After that date, there was indeed a spike of the presentation of projects that were possibly speculative in other academies. And a high point was reached with the so-called competition of 1796, which you see here on the screen, for a monument in Berlin to Frederick the Great. 
This was, as we know from the most recent research, not an open competition at all, but rather an event staged by Carl Gotthard Langhans, Berlin's most prominent architect and known to all of you as the designer of the Brandenburg Gate, in an attempt to force royal action to actually build this monument. Langhans had invited all of the leading figures of the Berlin School, and they all presented themselves with the drawing uh, on display. So this is perhaps one of the first exhibitions long before MoMA's famous 1932 international style show to attempt to bring together a body of work and define it as a school that was moving forward and would define the right way to go. So all of the Berlin classicists came together here to display how they thought a tomb for Frederick the Great uh, might be conceived. Heinrich Gens, Friedrich Gili, who you see on the screen, his famous project, Langhans, the, the sculptor Shadoff, Alois Hert, they all took part. One year later, they all submitted their projects to the annual Berlin Academic a uh, Exhibition, one of the great public events of the year. Well, it did not lead to the immediate execution of the project. That would take some 40 more years, and perhaps you know the statue in the middle of Unterdain Linden, a rather watered-down version of these great ambitions. It did make something extraordinary, at least for me, happen, which was that a young student of music decided to abandon his plans and his studies and to take up a career of architecture on the viewing of this drawing. And this was none other than Carl Friedrich Schinkel, whose first biographer, Gustav Wagen, in the booklet prepared later for the Schinkel Museum, the first ever monographic museum in architecture, claimed that it was the apotheosis in this drawing of the ability of architecture to embody the highest values of a society that convinced the 16-year-old Schinkel to enroll in the Young Bau Academy. There's much else in this, this vibrant period in the 1790s in Berlin. This building, which would come to house on its upper floors the new School of Architecture, where Schinkel would be a student, of the, uh, this is the Royal Mint by the architect Heinrich Gens, was exhibited in painting, in architectural drawings, in lithographs like this one, and in this workable model, all in the annual exhibitions. And it became one of the rage controversial topics of the period. Many people could not understand the style of it. They, uh, this is a debate that seems very foreign to us. They said it's not recognizably Egyptian. Greek, it has many solecisms in its use of the classical language of architecture. Is this possible? It unleashed a debate that went on for nearly two years. I won't take you back into the themes of that debate or its details, but what interests me is the activation of a debate, not through a building on the street, but through the possibility of bringing that building into a public frame uh, for a different kind of viewing and a different kind of debating. Interestingly, this model then went to become part of the model collection it was both the public museum in the building itself uh, and the training museum uh, for the young architects. And we could follow that to one of the great uh, debates of the early 19th century uh, when it was decided that a competition would need to be organized in order to have a democratic response to how to replace Britain's houses of parliament once they burned in a great uh, fire in the early 1830s. Uh, and the press began to demand first a competition which took place, but then to demand a public exhibition of those drawings. And those drawings were the first thing ever exhibited in the uh, first completed wing of William Wilkins's National Gallery on Trafalgar Square. I don't know why they didn't continue to have an architecture department, because they started the whole place with an architecture display. Uh, but the point is, again, that the debate over the Houses of Parliament now linked quite clearly to the debate over the form of representational government uh, all came together in one of the uh, inaugural uh, exhibitions of, of public architectural concern in early 19th century Britain. And I think we felt it ourselves in the aftermath of 9-11 when a great public outcry insisted that the competition be reorganized and that an exhibition of designs uh, take place uh, quite near the World Trade Center site, quite near Ground Zero, that the public might be involved, be polled. We know that the final result has very little to do uh, with that experience. And somehow, everything is available on the internet except an installation view of that, um, of that event. But I bring it back to you with this beautiful uh, design that we see uh, executed once a year that recalls uh, that event. And some of the optimism that came out of it in the belief that there could be a public engagement uh, in the remaking of the public sphere and of a building uh, in New York. If this were a complete history lesson, and I reassure you it won't be, we would need to look at the whole history of World's Fairs, uh, not only 
is the history of architecture written in terms of the highly experimental buildings, such as the Crystal Palace on the upper left of 1851 for the first Great World's Fair, uh, introducing glass and iron uh, architecture on a very, very large scale for the first time, ephemeral architecture always as a place of great experimentation, uh, but also the putting on display of architecture uh, that I think has a great deal to do with the re relationship of architecture to national identity. I'm going to call this section of my future uh, research not at home because it's about exhibiting your country somewhere else where it needs to be recognizable architecturally. So how do you make something look like France if you're exhibiting it in London? Uh, but th the last theme uh, of those exhibitions that fascinates me in their whole heroic history from the middle of the 19th century uh, into the late years of the 20th is the role that is played there in the birth of a extremely important movement that was later to play a role in New York at the Museum of Modern Art. And that was the movement for housing reform that I think is directly related to your own fascinations with interiors. Here the creation of buildings that could be visited, buildings that propose to improve what was called in mid-19th century England to improve the conditions of the working class, to evoke not only, uh, of course, uh, Engels and Marx, but also who, uh, in fact, visited uh, this building, but also to evoke Prince Albert, who was the patron of this model tenement built to show how the poor East End of London and other cities uh, could be improved uh, through a rather extraordinary building design. This deserves, too, to be decoded for you, but here it stands in for the origins of the housing reform movement uh, through architectural display. This is very paradoxical because, of course, this building was across the street from the Crystal Palace at Hyde Park, and it was visited actually by nearly as many people, partly because it was always free, whereas there was an admission price to the Crystal Palace on all but one day, uh, but also because it was so stunning to see in one of the wealthiest districts of London a display of a house meant to improve the lives of the people in the East End of London. Many of the visitors to the fair had probably never been to the East End of London. They had no idea of these conditions. So this has to do with my context, my notion that to take something out of its sight and to put it in a new context, the museum context in general, or here this fair context, uh, is to call attention to it, to enter it into debate, and to demand that we look at it in a new way. You're going to see that recurring. I don't know how many people are aware that the United States sent to the Paris World's Fair of 1900 an exhibition first shown on Lower Fifth Avenue of a proposal for reform tenements for the Lower East Side of New York. Here is the model that was sent along with uh, the uh, work of housing reformers. Um, and that I think actually fascinating because on one level it was a condemnation of urban conditions in this great immigrant city. On the other hand, it was meant to show that the United States had entered the international debate uh, on the uh, improvement of lower class dwellings and on the passage uh, of sanitary laws. This was actually to lead to certain legislation uh, in New York State. The last thing that World's Fairs provide for is another history that I don't have time to trace in detail, but this goes to the notion of creating a kind of architectural experiment that has never been seen before. So the history of architectural exhibitions in which an architecture is made and put on display of a type never seen before uh, is really the first premonition of the definition in the opening decades of the 20th century of the concept of the avant-garde in architecture. Here too we're at the Paris World's Fair of 1900 and this is the extraordinary pavilion that was conceived by the sometimes called Art Nouveau architect Henri Sauvage to house the dancer Louis Fuller. Everyone was enthralled, I should have brought the film, uh, by the movements of Lowy Fuller's uh, skirts and also the color that was projected onto them, the light show, uh, and Sauvage was asked to create a pavilion for that to take place. Uh, we won't go into the uh, rather scandalous entry in which you're invited to enter under her skirt uh, in order uh, to witness this display, but rather focus on the fact that Sauvage had been fascinated by the question of whether or not architecture of stone, of permanent materials, could represent movement. Uh, and he came up with an architecture that he thought was not only a symbol of Louis Fuller, but pushed his search for an architecture of flow, of movement, of transience uh, into a built experiment. 
Let's look for a few minutes at the uh, emergence of the avant-garde. We could do it through portraits. This is the standard type of the architect's portrait in the 19th century. I picked a particularly portly one. This is H.H. H. Richardson, uh, but it is a motif that if you go to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, you will see of nearly all of the great academicians of the 19th century in France. The architect depicts himself, not yet herself, almost always surrounded by works of art, often in the library or in a kind of gallery in the office, surrounding himself with images of culture. By the time we go to the, 19th, the 20th century, the favorite photographs of many architects is standing in front of a work of theirs in an exhibition. Here we have Walter Gropius standing in front of his proposal for the Chicago <coughs> Tribune building as it was exhibited in a retrospective exhibition, very little known in Germany, uh, not only in the Art Institute of Chicago. And Mies van der Rohe is standing in front of one of the most extraordinary spatial creations of the entire 20th century, uh, his short-lived Barcelona pavilion, a pavilion meant to represent Germany simply through rich materials, sliding planes, and free-flowing space uh, in Barcelona in 1929. Of course, this has recently been rebuilt, and you can experience something uh, like it, but it was that temporariness that allowed Mies to become uh, so experimental. One little polemical note, of course, despite some of the inaccuracies of the reproduction, one of the great things that you will not experience in Barcelona is Mises' awareness of the fact that this building was played off, as you can see in both of these photographs, by needing to pass through a colonnade of columns, which actually set up all of the axial and movement points. But that's another lecture, but it has something to do with the archaeology that those of us involved in the history of exhibitions need to do, not simply to know what was in an exhibition, but where it was, what it was next to, what was the context for its discovery. Just a few more famous examples to show you that by the early 20th century, we have the evolution already of what we can call the exhibitionary architect. There is a very important book in the history of art that has defined the emergence in the 19th century of the exhibitionary artist, the artist whose career is tied up with the ability to place a work in a form of public display. Architecture, we might have thought, would find its public display uh, on the streets, but by the 20th century, there are many projects that exist primarily for gallery space. This is perhaps a slight exception in that this is Vladimir Tatlin's famous monument to the Third International, first paraded through the streets of Petrograd on the left, and then put into a artistic exhibition uh, here uh, on the right. Uh, or if we continue to 19... Uh, 19, uh, with uh, a kind of inspiration from Tatlin's monument. I have one great quote, I must tell you. Mayakovsky, the great poet, documented this as he called it the first object of October. And then he went on to say that when the history of art is rewritten and will include this, it will note it as the first monument without a beard. Uh, so think of Richardson in that regard. Inspired by this new ethos, in Berlin, the Arbeitsrat für Kunst, the Work Council for the Arts, a good socialist name, was founded in March 1919 primarily as an organization for organizing exhibitions for artists and architects outside official venues. As mem founding member Walter Gropius explained, to create a new guild of craftsmen without the class distinctions which raise an arrogant barrier between craftsmen and artists a statement reworked later that year into the foundation manifesto of the Bauhaus itself. Now, in April 1919, the group's first exhibition at Neumann's Gallery in Berlin took place, the famous exhibition of unknown architects. I think they hoped that would change. It was a demonstration of the idea that artistic expressionism could also find itself uh, an architectural expressionism, as you see in these works by Finsterlin capable of projecting buildings whose primary goal was to serve as instruments for emotions, sentiments, and ideals, not only individual, but communal experiences that could serve to rebuild community spirit for a badly defeated nation. The exhibition circulated for over a year, first to the Art Museum in Weimar, where it was on view in the summer of 1919 as Gropius was preparing to open the Bauhaus, um, and then traveled around Germany. Much as the future exhibitions uh, before the war in Milan had, or in Petrograd, this is the last uh, futurist exhibition of December 1915, uh, the one that led to the famous split between Malevich and Tatlin, uh, the exhibition created in Berlin a sense of an exciting wave of artistic unity, vibrant if fragile, 
a sense of something about to happen. Even those excluded from it were transformed by it. The young Ludwig Mies, it's a very unfortunate name to be born with, it would translate as uh, Louis Measley or Louis Miserable, submitted a beautiful gouache rendering of the project he had been at work on before the war. Here you see it, a great villa for the Kohler Müller family in Holland. It would have been the forerunner of the Frick, not house not only the family, but their extensive art collections, the kind of house to become a museum. The project was rejected by Gropius, that Mies had submitted this drawing, as non-progressive formalism. Mies reacted violently. Within months, he changed his artistic direction and his name, adopting for his future submissions the name Mies van der Hoa, and submitting henceforth a series of projects unanchored from commissions and clients, projects that declared the exhibition as the true ground for inventing an architecture of the moment. Two years later, he made a spectacular entry into the discourse of ideas and images that made Berlin galleries and periodicals a focal point of the European avant-garde uh, uh, architectural debate, even as a fragile economy, fragile economy of the young Weimar Republic made commissions few and far between. I think you all know this drawing. I think it's the Mona Lisa of the architecture collection uh, at MoMA, the great walk-in drawing for a future glass skyscraper. And Mies went on from that exhibiting finally accepted by Gropius here in the first Bauhaus exhibition of 1923. I just want to show you a few images of this because this is the exhibition out of which the MoMA Architecture Department was born and out of which I think were codified all of the possibilities for architectural exhibitions uh, in the 20th century. The kind of catalog, if you will, the palette of choices that a curator has when trying to present ideas and designs in the impossible thing of bringing a glass skyscraper and a concrete office building into the small exhibition gallery uh, in the school. There's Gropius' Tribunal Tower. So there's a retrospective of recent work, some built, some not. Uh, Le Corbusier was involved in the same sort of thing in the same uh, uh, period. Here he is projecting a new city uh, as part of the Salon of 1922. Frank Lloyd Wright, an exhibitionary architect, only 10 years of his entire some 70-year career as an architect in which he was not involved in an exhibition. Uh, and then the Bauhaus, uh, this exhibition of 1923, not only giving us the retrospective that we've just seen, but also turning the whole building into an exhibition, repainting with Herbert Beyer the staircase, but Gropius redesigning his office as a model of a new type of space, uh, a space of shifting planes, a space of spaces within spaces, and a total artwork in which tapestries furniture, lighting, painting, uh, and spatial design, cabinetry, all came together to create a total environment. And the director could not move into his office, of course, until the exhibition was over. But it only lasted <laughs> two weeks. Likewise, a model house was designed by the students and one of their teachers, including all of the furniture. I like to show this extraordinary piece. They called the project of the house, which you see on the left, a project of building blocks. They wanted a prefabricated house that could be made out of simple modular units that might be realized in this ideal form or even in a reduced form once put into production. The furniture, likewise, dealing with the building block notion as something for children to learn to make with, pointing to the Bauhaus craft system. But this uh, kindergarten was designed for the house for the special uh, children's room it's a series of cabinets that could be disassembled, moved around by the children, wheeled around to make a puppet theater, to make different types of toys, one of them turns into a racing car, and then to store them all away when they were told to by their mother, who looked into this room from a window in the adjacent uh, kitchen. Some of you might have seen it. It was in the Bauhaus exhibition that we staged at MoMA a few years ago, uh, where it had just uh, arrived from having sold at auction a few years earlier. It belonged through most of the 20th century after the Bauhaus exhibition to one of the purchasers of the going out of business sale of this exhibition, Nicholas Pevsner, who used it for his children and then grandchildren and took it to London with him. So here's the international retrospective of architecture, great red cube. Let's turn to MoMA. Uh, quickly, because it's about a quickening pace, about the avant-garde, and also there's a reception waiting for us, but I wanted to show you how I've built on all of the fascinations of these previous generations that I've tried to draw out to build for myself something that I also think builds on uh, MoMA tradition. This is Alfred Barr's very famous 
diagram. Anybody who's had a course in 20th century art knows the cover of the exhibition Cubism and Abstract Art somehow never appears in architectural textbooks, curiously enough. I like to think of it as an eye chart for art historians. If you're worried about your prescription, you try to say, your eye doctor says, can you read as low as 1925? That's why modern architecture coalesced from Cubism, from the style, and from the Bauhaus, all feeding together into a unity around 25, 26. That's Korb, Mies, Aud, the heroes of the uh, exhibition that Philip Johnson and Henry Russell Hitchcock had, ha had staged uh, under the aegis of, um, of Barr just a few years uh, earlier. So interestingly, this notion consolidated at the museum that modern architecture had achieved a kind of um, starting point for a unified movement into the future. Uh, this is the Museum of Modern Art as uh, we know it today, if we go to the, its core at 11 West 53rd Street, photograph taken soon after its opening. I also always think that this is one that's hoping that when Corbusier comes back for a second U.S. visit, he'd been there in 35, undoubtedly he would arrive by airplane and he would know, like so many tourists <laughs> debarking at JFK, immediately where to go, 11 West 53rd Street. No effort required. Unlike the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art, there was no staircase to negotiate to get into the Temple of Art. Rather, we have one of the earliest buildings in the history of museums to take over the language of commercial architecture, a glass front that allows you to look into the museum as though it were a jewelry shop, uh, and a revolving door, more frequently to be found in department store design up until that point. So one of the first purpose-built museums to be entered from the sidewalk and to therefore declare a different kind of engagement both with everyday life and the things outside, but also, I'd like to think, with the public. It's interesting to trace the framework of the two temporary houses, or actually three, uh, before the museum moved into its purpose-built building in, by Goodwin and Stone in 1939, in time for its 10th birthday. Uh, it started out life in the uh, Crown Building uh, here uh, on the corner of 57th and 5th and then moved to one of the townhouses on 53rd Street with the address 11 West 53rd. I'd just like to point out that fact because it's interesting to remember, this is one of the famous views surviving of the interna so-called international style show of 1932, that it took place uh, in a neo-Renaissance skyscraper. So the framework of that historicist building is all the more important to understand the aesthetic of what at least appeared to be a white abstract architecture in these black and white photographs. Here, the Corbusier room uh, with the uh, Villa Savoie. Very traditional exhibition in certain ways, even if the architecture was thought to be uh, radical. Uh, the models were put up on little skirts uh, here to hide their understructure and to bring up a light to view them. Uh, the, uh, the photographs were all st staged to the same size and hung like so many photographs, uh, so many pictures. Uh, on the wall. Uh, here is the Bauhaus room, and I show only the second example of the exact same exhibition technique because it points to how conservative this first architectural exhibition was in terms of exhibition design. If we follow that same model, Corpius' Bauhaus model, to Paris, or follow it from Paris two years earlier, where it was exhibited in this extraordinary exhibition by Herbert Beyer, one of the first people to ever speculate on the fact that an architectural exhibition would have a completely different spatial relationship to its uh, viewers, to its audience, than an art exhibition, that rather than thinking of trying to frame pictures that they might be experienced as individual objects with a moment of contemplation and space around them and very little awareness of the space of the gallery meant to receive, Herbert Beyer defined a type of panorama of vision in the uh, in a kind of sense around, this long before IMAX, uh, in which these photographs and all of the reproductions that he needed, knew he needed to work with begin to create a new architecture. So the idea of the exhibition creating a sense around uh, architecture for this all-seeing eye. Or if we follow it back in 1938 to the Bauhaus exhibition uh, in New York installed interestingly in the lower concourse of Rockefeller Center in one of the unrented shops there that the museum occupied for a few months before it moved into its permanent headquarters. Herbert Beyer created an extraordinary surrealist spatial experience, something that had only been seen at the Museum of Modern Art 
I think, by, uh, in this extraordinary exhibition of 1934 by Philip Johnson, the Machine Art Exhibition. On the left, another view, the Frank Lloyd Wright uh, room of the 1932 exhibition, the inaugural exhibition of the Department of Architecture. On, uh, sorry, on the left. On the right, the inaugural exhibition of what was initially the Department of Industrial Art. The two fused permanently together in 1949 as architecture and design. Johnson had the brilliant idea of putting propellers, putting springs, industrial objects on display as though they had been designed by Brancusi or were sculptured uh, with a real sort of surrealist um, uh, sense of uh, humor, but a real notion of a recontextualization. Uh, that was largely absent from the early architecture exhibitions, but I want to bring out one really extraordinary element that is largely forgotten. And that has to do with the fact that the exhibition of 1932 contained with it, in it, a section that was organized by a group of people who were advocates for housing reform. And as much as this exhibition is often remembered as an aestheticizing manifesto, an architecture without any sense of social responsibility, simply an attempt at a new look for architecture as well as a new ethos of how construction might be expressed, there was an important section that was devoted to housing design. The same aesthetic was there, a model to be admired in the center. In this case, it was a housing project done recently by a avant-garde architecture architect in Kassel in Western Germany. But on the wall, the exactly same sized photographs were now not of architecture to be admired, but of housing conditions to be abhorred. They were photographs of Long Island City uh, slums and of slums, hard to believe, on East 86th Street, which was in that period uh, one of the poorest and most unsanitary uh, quarters of uh, New York. And this was partly the product of uh, Lewis Mumford, but also advised by the very young housing reformer, uh, Catherine Bauer. I like showing portraits of the people at the Museum of Modern Art in the 20s and 30s because they are all circa 30 at oldest. Uh, Alfred Barr was in his 20s when he became uh, director. Catherine Bauer's very influential book, Modern Housing, there you see her. Uh, during her, the years of her curatorial uh, activities. Fascinating, this book, Modern Architecture, famous in the history of architecture. This contemporary book, Modern Housing, famous in the history of housing. That's a discussion for another night, maybe for uh, an interesting thing here for your school to undertake. Why is the history of architecture and the history of housing so frequently two different strains, two different classrooms, two different professions? But to think not only at Bauer and Mumford exhibited this project by Lascaz and um, how for the uh, Christie Foresight housing, the only unbuilt project in the entire exhibition. And they organized visits for cities officials to come and see this project because they wanted to get it built. What a shock to arrive off the elevator on the 12th floor of the Crown Building and see this model installed as a different approach to high-rise building. And they went on in this context, if you look in the lower right, what a shock to walk into that very fancy townhouse on West 53rd Street the second home of the Museum of Modern Art, number 11, and come into the 1934 housing exhibit of the city of New York, where as you went past this super graphic with its large photograph of tenement houses in New York, contrasted with a housing project uh, under construction in Philadelphia on the left, you had an option of turning to the left or to the right. You can't quite see it, and the photographer didn't have the courage to photograph it, but on the right, you went into a perfect model room with tubular steel furniture and a library of books, all published by the Museum of Modern Art on architecture and design. Obviously, what a model, progressive, reform, working class family would like to have <laughs> as a living room. On the left, you went into the living room that had been removed from a tenement house, complete with its furniture, and to the scandal of the New York Post, its cockroaches, from a tenement on East 86th Street, where it was put on display and a form of uh, contrasts worthy of Pugin uh, in the 19th century. This was an extraordinary exhibition. It concluded with the real property inventory and a desk where a fake mortgage advisor would sit with you and discuss <laughs> financial arrangements of how to deal with your own housing situation in the midst of the incipient depression. So I'd like to think even here, the notion of participatory architecture, performance, you could say here, the advisor is present, uh, was already pioneered in this extraordinary uh, project in which Catherine Bauer played, one of my heroes, played such an important role. So if we fast forward, the idea of reforming housing, either 
uh, working class or middle class continued at the museum very dramatically with Marcel Breuer's House in the Garden of 1949. And it was this tradition, in closing, I just want to show a few images of my projects that I sought uh, to work with when I came to MoMA. I immediately went up to the archives, which are extraordinary at the museum, uh, because uh, I'm a historian and I thought, wow, a new source, I can begin to study them. But also, and I know there are many colleagues from MoMA past and future here, I was already starting to hear uh, oh, MoMA doesn't do that. Oh, MoMA does this. This is what MoMA is. And I became fascinated by the fact that people, I said, name an exhibition of architecture at MoMA. And the same four would always come out. The international style, mm -hmm. Italy, the new domestic landscape, uh, maybe one or two others uh, are known to everyone, have taken their place in the history uh, of architecture and design and have been enormously influential. But when you start to look down the list, there's several hundred others. What happened to those? Those are not only incredibly fascinating to study, they were incredibly of their moment, many of them, uh, but happily for me, they actually gave freedom to basically do whatever you want. You can find in the DNA of MoMA a line of thought, a productive line of thought of many different strains, not only an aestheticizing agenda, but also one that really wants to um, reform, not simply the look of architecture, but the possibility uh, of uh, its purpose uh, and its ability actually to address issues of the day. And I've tried to show you that with the coexistence of the principles of a new international style with the demand for housing reform that actually led to changes in the New York City Department of Housing and led to important legislation uh, in the federal government on housing in the 1930s, most of it now largely um, evacuated. So in 2007, when I arrived and uh, we realized that there was this vacant lot next to the museum, I asked, couldn't we use that to place uh, on display something that was really bothering me, which was why in the architectural world there was a group of people who read Dwell magazine and were fascinated by a return to a kind of nostalgia for mid-century modern prefabrication. And then there was a group, many of which I knew at Columbia, who were fascinated by digital fabrication and the idea of the new paradigm of the non-standard uh, or of the uh, capacity to move from mass standardization to mass customization. And I thought all of these people are interested in factory architectures. They're interested in producing a replicable object through the most up-to-date uh, possibilities of creating a object in a factory situation, even a digitally controlled machined situation, and delivering it to uh, another place as a finer product and also more efficiently where site work and uh, where site work and design work might happen simultaneously uh, rather than in sequence. But yet they don't talk to one another. And so I wanted to stage an exhibition that could bring together these two strains in architectural thinking now almost a decade ago and perhaps uh, bring them into conversation with one another. Um, that's a conversation for another moment. I think in many ways it f I failed to produce that conversation. Those two groups are still quite separate. Uh, they were a little bit astounded to find themselves in the same gallery and on the same lot. Uh, but I did get uh, a great uh, percentage of the public fascinated by many of these issues through the possibility of realizing full-scale buildings on the outdoor lot. Now this is obviously, as you've seen, in the tradition that goes back to the World's Fair of 1851, the Great Exhibition. It goes back also to the history of housing reform uh, that uh, was uh, pioneered there. I think it's something that speaks very much to concerns right now. As in the uh, twilight moments of the Bloomberg administration, we were asked to think about micro units and uh, uh, all sorts of issues that are on, uh, on the docket uh, now, particularly uh, with the urgencies of being able to produce affordable housing in cities that are increasingly uh, becoming totally unaffordable. Uh, and so some of these issues were already at stake here. This was a complex exhibition, but I only want to point out one thing in order to then segue to my closing, which brings us back to a floodable New York. That'll make us all want to run for a drink around yeah. the corner. Uh, and that was my uh, realization that the exhibition needed to be about process rather than product. And I asked myself the question, how can you put on display in a museum the 
what goes into uh, thinking? What is design thinking? How can design thinking be on display rather than products? We have to realize that this is the moment, 2007, uh, when the word Starchitect is being uh, coined, uh, when the celebrity architect who appears on the cover, not simply of architecture magazines, but of, uh, of time, of people, uh, of uh, style magazines, uh, was emerging. Uh, and it was a moment when it seemed to me <coughs> that the public was in awe of the phenomena of celebrity architects, but it didn't bring with it any greater appreciation or understanding either of what's involved in being an architect, of designing, whether it be an interior, an exterior, or a part of a city, uh, and what was involved in the choices that were made in, uh, in making architecture. I wondered how that could be put on display at the same time as I began to wonder in the age of the internet with which I began, does it still totally make sense to display objects uh, in a museum? Yes, because the people will come, but I decided as well the internet could become our friend. So just to give a small example of this, here is the uh, lot with three of the five houses uh, photographed from the tallest of them when it was completed early in the summer of 2008 and a few weeks earlier uh, when the framework for the digitally produced house that you see in the back um, by uh, the uh, Australian architect Jeremy Edmonston along with his then American partner Doug Gautier uh, was being delivered uh, to start its somewhat difficult construction. Interestingly, the more traditional the prefabrication process, the easier it took place. But how to make that be the part of the display? Because my objects were held together not by the fact that they had the three characteristics of some new style, but by the fact that the design thinking was all, of the same, all the same. How do I make something when it's going to be fabricated elsewhere by other people to be delivered to the site? Hence the title of the show, uh, Home Delivery. How do I keep the drama of what you see there uh, on, uh, on display? In the historical part of the exhibition, which took part inside the museum, I did this by working with a filmmaker to collect 80 years of films of prefabrication taking place in uh, factories and having them playing above your head so that this motion was not only documentary but was meant to remind you that everything in this treasure trove uh, of ideas uh, tried in prefabrication had come into being uh, by a system of thinking of the possibility of creating not a one-off but a replicable object. And for the outside lot, we realized in this early experiment with an interactive uh, website uh, at the museum that the web could be our friend, not duplicating the exhibition, but coming to document what I realized was that the, this exhibition had a life that was much longer than the three months it would be on display in the gallery and on the lot. Rather, it began when we commissioned the architects. So on the website, we created, you can see here, six blocks which represent uh, Monday through Saturday, very Genesis. On the seventh day, everybody tried to rest. Actually, on the seventh day, there was a steady cam uh, on the site at MoMA. So for about 12 weeks, once a, uh, one day a week, each of these would be updated by the team who would show themselves designing, then show themselves moving into the factory, then show the house being delivered to the truck or the ship, and then show it arriving. And only in the last two weeks did this site become active. There were five projects, and the sixth, the curators, talked about the evolution uh, of the exhibition. And you can see this daily update of the, uh, what was going on on the site. And then we kept this open during the exhibition for people to comment, to blog, uh, to write editorials, and afterwards to become a kind of chat forum. So this basically was the, um, the Petri dish, if you will, for a project that came about uh, and I want to, if you'll bear with me for just a few more minutes, give you an introduction to where we started. This is the project that was already uh, evoked at the very introduction. This is the project, uh, one of whose designs you saw in the opening slide, Rising Currents, projects for New York's uh, waterfront. The impetus for this was an extraordinary uh, study done by the engineer Guy Nordenson, the landscape architect Catherine Siebert, and the architect Adam Urinsky. They had worked together with a grant from the American Institute of Architects uh, on a study of New York Harbor as a test case on how coastal cities, and something like 51% of the population of the world now lives in cities, and over half of that population lives in floodable cities. So this is not simply a New York problem. 
Their study, though, took New York as a kind of global situation, uh, and they proposed a series of sites where they could trace the uh, reactions of those sites to storm surge and rising uh, storm currents. And they produced a beautiful volume of research, and they came to me early in the fall of 2008 with this research, and they said, don't you think this would make a wonderful exhibition? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> It'll be another data scape, another Rem Koolhaas information design. It's all background. This is a department of architecture. We want to promote the making of architecture. We want to promote the act of design. We do not want to join the information design revolution uh, and show research as layout. Um, it's a fantastic book, and Guy would not mind that I was saying this, because together we concocted the idea, because this discussion coincided with the financial meltdown of 2008, we concocted the idea of inviting interdisciplinary teams of young designers. We asked each team to create their dream design team, often architect plus landscape designer, sometimes ecologist, uh, many other uh, professions coming together to try to instigate a conversation in each team across professions, but then across teams working on these five sites. This was in the immediate aftermath, of course, of Katrina. The levees had failed at New Orleans, and Guy proposed that the U.S. Car Army Corps of Engineers needed to think not only about concrete, but also about soft infrastructural systems. This is the manifesto he provided the teams, and this is the first result already appearing in New York Magazine before the exhibition opened. So here was an exhibition that was already being commented, publicized, debated, and discussed for New York even before it had been opened. Why is the exhibition itself? Because we had invited the teams to take up residence in MoMA PS1. Klaus Biesenbach had a problem. He, too, had a budget shortage. I had a lot of unemployed designers to whom I was able, thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation, to give some money to work at PS1. Klaus couldn't keep every single gallery open for that season, so they became workshops. Uh, and ultimately, this is extreme sports workmanship, curatorship. We brought the results of those workshops two weeks later to MoMA and installed them to make this exhibition. This was a 10-week project from start to finish. <laughs> so it's about extreme sports, but it's also about being very, very reactive to take on a problem and exhibit it. It had only been done once before in this critique of urban renewal in 1967. The new city staged at MoMA, a brilliant project, but there the four teams had gone back to their architecture schools. I invited them to move into MoMA PS1, where we do young architects each summer, as you see in the courtyard, and there they began an architecture studio. You all know what a design studio is. You all know the culture in this school, where you look at one another's work and discuss it. Architecture students all know that, but the public doesn't realize that architects are not decorators of ideas that occur uh, to other people. They don't realize that architecture is a form, in a sense, of policy making and of thinking that starts with the problem and through the act of designing both defines it and begins to work towards its solution, not only in policy ways but in formal ways. So during this workshop we not only invited in experts but we invited the public in to talk with the architects, to see the work in process, uh, and how did we get them there? We put this at the top of the elevator at MoMA. This is New York Harbor evolving towards 2080 at the end, and to make you uh, scared, not thirsty. Um, <laughs> let me just quickly show you one project, and I think I've abused your time, uh, but I want to leave you with something more than fright, because the show, these are the evacuation zones, here's the Army Corps of Engineers' proposals for where the storm barriers might come, and here are our five team sites. We'll look at zero, and very quickly, I'm going to skip ahead and look at four. Zero was a back to the future. This had just come out of, as well. Eric Sanderson, incredible naturalist, showing what New York was like. And the team zero realized that what New York needs to do is to restore something of what has been lost. They need to restore a absorptive skirt. This was ARO with D-Land Studio, Susanna Drake. They need to bring a greater irregular bathymetry to the sea floor to break waves. And in the process, they can create actually uh, a city that functions better as well on a day-to-day -day basis. Why not not get flooded subway and street and new shoes alike every time it rains in New York? Why not create these kind of Melita filters, coffee filter streets that it can absorb water and deal with storm surge that comes as much from the sky as it does from the tidal waves 
breaking through the Verrazano Narrows? And why not create parks that might be underwater when they're needed to go into service to protect the city? This is a project that's extremely scary. Number two, I'm so frightening, I'm not going to take you to this oil refinery <laughs> in the flight path of Newark Airport, which will be 80% underwater by 2050 if nothing is done. You don't need the Exxon Valdez to capsize for a problem. There's the refinery. Matthew Baird and his team had the idea of converting the unused factories on the Bayonne ship piers into a recycling factory for glass, taking all those jars you put out on Friday morning and recycling them into uh, huge jacks that would be thrown into the sea to create a storm-breaking uh, barrier here, the glass reef, at the same time as you build a monumental berm to protect his future biofuel plant on the site of the brown site of the refinery. And then lastly, uh, Kate Orff, a landscape designer working with a group of ecologists, <coughs> proposes to turn the Gowanus Canal, here you see in her beautiful panorama, into the world's largest oyster hatchery, making us finally be able to answer the question of all of those visitors to New York, why is there an oyster bar in Grand Central Station when there are no oysters in New York Harbor for about 50 years now? She's going to bring them back and explain to us why any terminal in a port city would have an oyster bar, but she's also going to take advantage of them because of the fact that oysters are the vacuum cleaners of the sea. They clean the water, and then they do something very nice, they're very social. As soon as they're about a few weeks old, they glue themselves to one another and form a wave-breaking barrier reef. So she's going to move them out of the Gowanus Canal in their teenage years uh, and form a barrier reef between Governor's Island uh, and Brooklyn to break storm surge as it approaches Manhattan. And finally, she imagines the Gowanus will become a branch oyster bar. <laughs> we blogged about it, we discussed it, and we did all of this two years before Hurricane Sandy led to the city asking <coughs> if they could have the full transcript of what went on in the workshops. We took on another workshop for closed rehousing the American dream. I don't have time to talk to you about it. I've overstayed my welcome. But we managed on that occasion to get at the final review open to the public, but also then Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Sean Donovan, to come and see the projects and to review them. Uh, and many members of, these, of the teams from Rising Currents were invited then by Donovan into his ongoing study of coastal resilience. We hope to have a similar impact on rethinking about housing in the inner suburbs, which was the theme of this project. Very, very complex work again here, the product of a 12-week studio. And I just jump ahead because nobody can work at MoMA without giving you an advertisement for what's to come. Please come next week when we open the third of these workshops. It has to do with the problem of growing inequality uh, in cities. It's uh, conceived and curated by my colleague who you see here on the screen, Pedro Godano, called Uneven Growth. And it's the third of these intensive workshops to take on pressing issues. So in conclusion, I would say that out of that whole history, what I learned from myself was that if an exhibit of architecture can be vital in the 21st century, it's by giving the design profession something that the marketplace doesn't necessarily give them, and then give them a venue in which the public can debate it and to exploit, finally, the internet for not only the publicity, but the further engagement and the continuation of those ideas uh, as they continue to be timely beyond the three-month stretch of the impossible act of bringing architecture into the gallery. Thank you for your patience. I'm sorry. <laughs> opening, uh, Pedro is the curator of contemporary um, architecture at MoMA, uh, and he is open, he's installing this show right now, it's almost finished, beautiful. Uh, it has team, five teams from around the globe this time, looking at five different cities around the globe. I think this is um, in Brazil. Uh, and it opens at the end of next week in the architecture gallery on the third floor, in the exact same space where rising currents and foreclosed took place. Any other questions? Some of you I know are going to come across for a drink and something to eat, and I'd be happy to continue to discuss that. Okay, why don't we continue to move to the gallery space and we can continue the discussion? Thank you.